أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين فاطر السماوات والأرضين ثم الصلاة والسلام والتحية والإكرام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد محمد وعلى وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المظلومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا وقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإذ أخذ ربك من بني آدم من ظهورهم ذريتهم وأشهدهم على أنفسهم ألست بربكم قالوا بلى شهدنا أن تقولوا يوم القيامة إنا كنا عن هذا غافلين أو تقولوا إنما أشرك آباؤنا من قبل وكنا ذرية من بعدهم أفتهلكنا بما فعل المبطلون صدق الله العلي العظيم السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله الآخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين صلوا على محمد وعلى محمد Please scoot forward while reciting a loud salat على محمد وعلى محمد Brothers and sisters in Iman, Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My condolences again to all the believers and especially the Imam of our time, Ajr Allah Ta'ala Faraj al Sharif. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. On the tragedy of Sayyid al Shuhada and his companions in the land of Karbala. Yesterday we spoke about the ayat of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. In, this, in his creation are all over for us. His creation itself is an ayah. And embedded in that, in all of those signs, are signs for us to recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also signs for us to understand who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to us is not just a theological idea that we think about, we have an assent to those propositions, we have what they call tasdiq al qadaya you believe these sentences and then you relegate them to some pedestal in your mind and go about your life as you were. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Islam, in all the divinely revealed religions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a relationship with His creation. He's not just someone who made us, not just a creator. But he's someone intimately familiar with us, intimately involved in our lives and wants us to move forward and to progress towards him and seek that qurba. And to seek that qurba 
And to have a relationship with someone means that there is a certain give and take. We must reciprocate what someone gives to us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us existence. He gives us his blessings. He gave us life. He gave us free open air to breathe. And many more from our health, from our youth. And he expects in return a recognition of his maqam. A following of the command that he gave in order to benefit us. So kalam, ilmul kalam, the science of theology, is useful and necessary. And the ulama have dedicated years of their studying in their lives to understand intellectually and rationally and logically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it was never meant to be the end all be all. That our understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not limited to academics and intellectuality. That is a limiting of the faculties Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given a human being for him to realize who he is, what he is, and where is his place in creation. Within this relationship of give and take, it is an agreement. It is a type of pact. And this is something that the Quraysh of Mecca must have realized and understood about their prophetic mission. Because it would have been very simple to just say you believed and then continue to do whatever it is you were doing beforehand. But to them, when someone would recite the words of the Shahadatain, Ashadu an la ilaha illallahu wahdahu la sharika la, wa ashadu anna Muhammadan sallallahu alayhi wa alihi abduhu wa rasuluhu. Allahumma salam. These were not just words, they were not just the types of prayers and invocations they may have done in front of the idols in the Haram of Mecca. But they knew that this was a life-changing moment because it involved a new agreement, a pact, a divine covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of recognizing his maqam. And so by recognizing who and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, that relationship and action must follow from that. So you come under the wilaya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willingly. And you come under the wilaya of Sayyid al-Mursaleen alayhi salam. Willingly. This idea of a pact, and the idea of a pact, bay'a, we have those ahadith, both in the books of our ulama, such as Al-Kafi, and the books of Shaykh al-Saduq, our ulama, but also the ulama of Ahl sunnah in their books of ahadith, they have hadith that mention the necessity of an imam, that you must have bay'a, that he so dies without bay'a on his neck. I mean, he has not submitted himself to the wali, to the imam, that person will die a death of jahili. Bay'a was something understood to be sacred even amongst the Arabs. That agreements and pacts are important. Before even the advent of the Prophet's message sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. The area around the Kaaba and Mecca, the city itself, was also understood to be a haram a sanctuary in which no tribal warfare was allowed. They had an agreement and they had made a pact with the Bedouins and the surrounding tribes of the Arabs that in this square kilometer radius, in these many kilometers around Mecca, around the Kaaba, there will be no tribal warfare. And in return, and there will be no raiding of the caravans that come to Mecca. And in return, you exclusively, the tribes who live there, will be allowed to give safe passage to the caravans trying to enter Mecca for Hajj and for business. Many such agreements and pacts were done prior to Islam because they understood that agreements and pacts, a covenant is sacred. It has a trust to it. And a trust, if you have no trust, 
then your society will fall into chaos. If you have no understanding of goodwill and trust, nothing productive will happen in that society. Even before revelation had begun, Al-Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa alihi was known as as sadiq al amin the honest and the trustworthy. And no one could doubt the Prophet. Even when he came with Islam, when he brought them a message that they did not like, especially because it had socio, economic, and political repercussions for Quraysh. But they did not doubt his sincerity. They did not doubt who the Prophet was because he had always been a sadiqun Amin. And in Islam, after the message, understanding Islam is not just beliefs, but understanding Islam as a covenant, we can see in the lifetime of the Prophet itself. During the early years of Mecca, the Prophet was constantly giving da'wah. He first started with his family, his ashira. When Abu Lahab or Abu Hakam mocked the Prophet in front of his entire family because when the only one who stood up to follow the Prophet to be his wazir and to be his khalifa was a young man by Ali ibn Abi Talib, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. And they laughed at him and they laughed at Abu Talib. And then he continued to spread his message to the other tribes of Quraysh. But at a certain point, they had become very recalcitrant. They had become very stubborn. And he continued his message to those who were not from Mecca. When the season of Hajj came, he came to Mina and he would go to the different tribes, calling them to Islam. And it was at one moment where he came across a group of men from a city that was called Yathrib, which we now call, we now call Medina. There were a number of men from Khazraj, one of the warring tribes in Medina at that time. He asked them who they were. He said, we are from this city and we are from this tribe. And he asked, are you the ones who are the clients of the Jewish tribes? Because why were the Jews in the middle of the desert in Arabia? They had come and they were waiting for the predicted and prophesied prophet. And so he recited the Quran to these Arabs, to this tribe. And they realized that this is the prophet that the Jews in our own city are waiting for. And they would threaten us with his arrival, that once we come, we're going to have our revenge against you. And so, the Ansar, who would no, later become known as the Ansar, they became Muslim. And when they came back the next year, bringing more of their tribe from Aus and Khazraj, they didn't just say Shahadatain, but they said the Shahadatain. They accepted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his Tawheed and the servitude and messengership of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad But he also took from them a bay'ah He took from them a covenant that they would not do shirk that they would not steal that they would not commit infanticide they would not kill their children that they would not slander and they would not make up information and bring it to the Prophet. They would not forge lies. They would not disobey him and what was ma'roof, the known good and what was understood. And if they uphold this covenant, for them is Jannah. And if they break this covenant, then their affair is with Allah. If He wishes to forgive you, He forgives you. If He wishes to punish you, then He punishes you. And the idea of Islam being a covenant, but not simply a covenant that started in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi but sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad but the deen of submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and making this covenant is something that happened much before our understanding and coming into this world the ayah I recited at the beginning of this majlis was when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
says Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And recall when your Lord brought forth descendants from the loins of the sons of Adam and made them bear witness against their own selves. Am I not your Lord? And they said, Of course, yes, we bear witness to this. Lest you claim on the day of judgment that we were heedless of this. Or you might say, it was only that our fathers were those committing shirk and we just happened to be there. Progeny. So are you going to try to destroy us, punish us for what some false people did before us? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals this verse. What kind of image would have shown to those around him? There's an idea that he pulled forth our souls before our birth into this world and took from us this covenant that there is a primordial realm what they call an alim al-dharr a world of atoms a world of particles and this is the type of understanding that comes from the ahadith of Ahlul Bayt السلام, that the companions of our imams one they read the Quran very much and they would come to the imams asking them about the tafsir and the ta'wil of many verses. Because when they would read the Qur'an, they would find things that were wondrous. So they understood that this was a covenant. And one of the companions came to Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi afdhul salati wa salam. And when he took this covenant, he asked, was this covenant face to face with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And the Imam said, yes. And from this covenant, فَثَبَتَتِ الْمَعْرِفَةِ وَنَسِوَ الْمَوْقِفِ That at that point, your ma'rifah of Allah was established. But you forgot what happened. You forgot the scene. You forgot that you were brought up prior to your birth, prior to your existence in this world. To make this covenant. صَلُّوا عَلَى مُحَمَّدُ وَعَلَى مُحَمَّدُ But through this covenant, inside you is the ma'rifah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَسَيَذْكُرُونَهُ And they will come to remember this. وَلَوْلَا ذَلِكَ لَمْ يَدْرِ أَحَدٌ مَنْ خَالِقُهُ وَرَازِقُهُ When were it not for this covenant, not a single person would understand, not a single person would know who is their creator and who is their raziq. Now when the companion asked, is this face to face with Allah? And the Imam said, yes. Allah does not have a body. The Imams taught and believed in a pristine tawheed that has no shirk in it. That does not limit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how does one come to have a face to face meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? There is another hadith from another companion of our sixth Imam by the name of Abu Basir. Abu Basir comes to the Imam and asks, are we going to see Allah on the day of judgment? And he says, yes. And so Abu Basir is a little bit confused. And the Imam says that, in fact, the mu'mineen will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this dunya, before the day of judgment. And he says, when, when have we seen it before? And the Imam replies when he said, Alastu bi rabbikum qalu bala. That when he took this covenant, you saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abu Basir was still confused. And the Imam said that, in fact, you will see him in this dunya. In fact, Abu Basir, don't you see him right now? In this moment of yours? Abu Basir was in wonder. And so he asked the Imam, can I have your permission to recite this hadith? Spread it. And he said, stay away from doing that. Because often what will happen is an ignorant person will deny it and understand it to be that I have committed kufr and I have likened Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to his creation. But he says something that shows us that this vision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not of a physical nature. Where he says, وَلَيْسَتِ الرُّؤْيَا بِالْقَلْبِ كَالْرُؤْيَةِ بِالْعَيْنِ 
that a vision of the heart is not the same as vision with the eyes. So the Imam is explaining that we were taken prior to our existence in this world for a covenant and we were face to face with Allah but not in a way in which we see with the eyes because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unlimited, has no boundaries. But with our hearts we saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many ulama have disputed these ahadith and this understanding because to them it seemed a bit strange or illogical. Because they asked questions such as, well, how does it happen before creation and then we forget it? How is it that you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And those are legitimate questions that the ulama have asked and there is a debate between them. But these ahadith do not need to be literal as many might have understood it. They may be allegorical and metaphorical. That we in our own material existence, we don't even understand the entirety of this universe. We don't understand how human beings see form. We don't understand like when I look at a flower, I look at a book, I don't just see a bunch of particles and a bunch of bits, but I see a whole together. We don't understand how the human mind does that. We don't understand the variety and the vastness of the biology of the oceans, for example. There are so many unknowns to us even in this world that are far beyond our comprehension. That when they first identified and tried to find out what a light was, first it was a... a First it was a ray, first it, then it was a photon particle, sometimes in between. These discussions have continued and there's more and more research and more wondrous things found that we did not know before, that were beyond our understanding. And so, when the Imams try to teach us something that is beyond our understanding, when the Imams try to liken something and explain something to us that is far beyond this material, natural world, of course there's going to be a lack of full depth and understanding on our part. Of course there's going to be a loss of precision based on the nature of the natural world, the limitations of language, the limitations of our human and material understandings. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Many of the urafa, for example, when they talk about the ayat in the Qur'an of what they describe Jannah, that it will have lofty couches, it will have rivers, wine that does not cause any drunkenness or a headache. But they say that these are examples and metaphors of the highest and most wanted desirable things to some human beings, especially those in the time of the Prophet but the world of the Akhirah and Yawm Al-Qiyamah is not material in the same way our world is material. It is something different. And there's supposed to be a world we can't imagine. That these are just ways for us to understand. Ways for us to get excited and to be motivated to work for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's paradise. To work towards His qurba. Now the second... He took the children of Adam from the loins of his son, from the descendants. He didn't just say that I took the children of, we, we took the descendants of Adam's children. We, everybody knows that humankind are the descendants of Nabi Adam alayhi But he's particularly said from their loins, perhaps to remind us where is the origin and the beginning of a human being? That the human being, he comes from a drop of najasa. That this is your beginning as a human being in this world. That Amir al-Mu'minin alayhi afdhul salati wa He says in a riwayah, Ma libni Adam wal What is with 
the son of Adam, any child of Adam, and having pride. وَإِنَّمَا أَوَّلُهُ نُطْفَةٌ وَآخِرُهُ جِيفَةٌ That the beginning of this human being was a single sperm, a drop of najasa, and his ending will be a corpse from one najasa to another najasa. And in another riwayah it says that he starts out from a drop of najasa, he dies as a putrid corpse in the, in the, in the middle of his life. He carries around his own filth. So where is a human being in having pride? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse is trying to tell us that I have created you in such a way and if you were to look at yourself, reflect and ponder on your own creation, you will understand how impoverished you are how weak and feeble you are. One that your origin and your ending is nothing glamorous, nothing fancy, nothing to be necessarily proud of. And that you'll find that no matter how strong you think you are, no matter how rich you think you are, no matter how strong your mind is, no matter how strong your mind is, no matter how smart you think you are, you are unable to repel death. You are unable to repel sickness from yourself. You are unable to live without air. You are unable to do the wondrous things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows you in His creation. You cannot create life like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did. That the human being is what they call Ain al Faqr. That he is himself poverty in and of itself, the biggest example of poverty. That you are. Al-Faqir إِلَى اللَّهِ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى That you are impoverished, you are in need. And this is part of your primordial creation. That the verse says that I don't want you to have the excuse that we were غَافِلِينَ from this. He did not say جَاهِلِينَ or نَاسِينَ He did not say that you were unaware of this. He did not say that you were forgetful of this, but you are heedless of it. To be heedless of something. Ghafla is different than ilm in jahl. Ghafla is different than nisyan, forgetfulness. Jahl is that you didn't know something. Ignorance. Nisyan is you knew something and then you forgot it. It was in your mind at one point and then it's somewhere else. But ghafla is that you knew it. You did not forget it. You came to know it. You did not forget it. But you relegated it to the side. You put it aside. And we thought that we are very powerful. We thought that we could change Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. Change our natures. We thought that we could live without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We could do whatever we want. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the types of tawheed we discussed a few nights ago was tawheed al-af'al. And the type of shirk that comes with tawheed al-af'al is that you think you're outside the dominion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That you think that everything that I have is from my own hard work. That everything I have and what I've achieved is my doing. When Nabi Zakaria alayhi salam asked from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then Allah revealed to him that we are giving you the good news of a child whose name will be Yahya and his response was how can I have a child when my wife is barren she has reached that age where she cannot have a child anymore and I have reached this extremely old age how can someone like me have a child? And Allah says that this is all easy for him. I created you from nothing when you weren't anything. That don't think that the means that we see in this world and the apparent material cause and effect as our end all be all. That we lose hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To have despair in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one of the 
major kaba'ir from the sins after shirk. To lose hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because ultimately it will return back to a form of shirk. That you think that the situation is hopeless such that not even Allah can fix it. That we think we've given up all hope and we've even up, given hope up in Allah's mercy. We're always in need of Allah's mercy and always in need of Allah's grace. That in fact, there's no difference between the person who is apparently wealthy and the person who is apparently poor in their endeavors in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah put them where He put them. But there's no more real certainty, for example, in the child who went to medical school and has his life and his savings and his ma'ash versus the some person who studied something else. He went to became a teacher, for example. There's no difference in the risk that they're going to be allotted from the perspective of Allah. Everybody has their risk. But to think we're outside of that and it's what we do and my decisions purely and my material cause and effect that give me my risk, that give me my blessings, that sustain my life. That is an arrogance on the, a part of the human being. And so, if you are ghafil, you are heedless of this, Allah will not take that as an excuse. You knew it, you ignored it. You did not take the time to reflect on it. Nor can you use as an excuse your upbringing. Can you blame your environment? Because the mushrikeen, their response in this ayah that Allah is trying to do away with is that, you know, we were just the kids of mushrikeen. And they did shirk, so we did shirk, and what are we going to do about it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that is not an excuse. You have an intellect, you have capabilities that He has blessed you with to use, to reflect. For if you were just to see the human condition you have for just a few moments, you would understand your faqr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how in need of Him we are. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now we might ask them, what is the correct tafsir of this verse? Is it the uh, hadith from the Imams Ali Muslim, or is it this explanation? There is a way to understand them together, but the important point to draw from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in this verse is that we cannot limit our ma'rifah, our knowledge, our cognizance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to one faculty we have. We can't ignore the even emotional aspects to faith. We can't ignore our experiential aspects of faith and so solely focus on the intellectual and academic aspects of it. Because a human being is not purely an intellectual being. He is not just a, an aqal that floats out in space. He is physical, he is emotional, he has a nature, he has intuitive pulls for him. He has a primordial nature, a Proclivity, that fitrah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in the human being on the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in that alim al dhar that the Imam spoke about regards to this verse, we, some people might have asked the Imams, why is it that the Prophet is the Prophet? Why is Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? Why is he Khatam al Mursaleen versus somebody else? Why is it Amir al Mu'mineen? Why is Ali ibn Abi Talib the Wasi al Awsiya? Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa alayhi wa alayhi And the Imam explained through this covenant before our creation. He says that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pulled out all the arwah, all of the souls of His creation from mankind, and He asked them to testify to His rububiyyah, am I not your Lord? Do you not affirm my obedience and my wilayah over you? And the first to respond was Rasulullah Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. 
And the second to respond was Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. And then the rest of the imma from Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. And then the remaining prophets and messengers and awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is a reflection of our, our primordial existence in this alim adhar is a reflection of who we are and who we end up becoming in our life. That they were anwar, that the Ahlul Bayt were nur before they came into this low material creation. That we recite in the ziyara of Imam Hussein that he was in the anur, in the loins of the prophets and messengers, and in the wombs of their women, that came down to Banu Hashim, came down and split between Abdullah and Abu Talib into the Prophet and Imam Ali and came down to Imam Hussein. And then from there, the rest of the Aima. Imam Hussein was those who understood his covenant and remembered his covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He knew that this is not my life for myself. This is not my religion to do with as I please with it. Like Yazid and Muawiyah had done with. Calling themselves Khalifatullah, Khalifatul Rasulullah. And when Imam Hussein Islam had tragically left from Medina, he headed towards the birthplace of our Prophet. He went to Mecca to perform the Hajj. When Imam Hussein arrived in Mecca, he would have begun his Umrah, performed his rituals and rites, but when it came time for Hajj to begin, Imam Hussein soon realized that I am not even safe in the Haram of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I was not safe in the home of my grandfather, the Haram of Rasulullah. And I am not safe when I come to the Haram of the Lord of the Kaaba, where I'm not even allowed to harm any animal. When Imam Hussein was thinking about leaving, his younger brother, Muhammad ibn al-Hanafi, came to him and he said that, oh my brother, Oh, Hussein, do not go towards Kufa. Do not buy into what they say to you because I know who Ahlul Kufa are. I was there when they betrayed our father when he needed them most. I was there when the people of Kufa left Imam Hassan to be stabbed. Oh, my brother. Do not go to Kufa, go somewhere else. Go to Yemen, go to a safe place. And Imam Hussein said to his brother, Oh, Muhammad, now is not the time for me to dispute with you. Now is not the time for me to argue. I will think well and hard about what you have just said, and I will make my decision. And when the next morning came, when Muhammad ibn Hanafiya came from his home, he saw that there were Caravans getting ready to leave. And he saw that his brother Hussein, the women of Bani Hashem, his daughters, the sons, the youth of Bani Hashem were getting ready to go. And he came to his brother and he said that, Oh my brother, oh Hussein, you didn't, do you not say that you would think hard and that you would take what I said seriously? He said, Oh my brother Muhammad, I thought about what you had said, but when I had stopped for a moment and my eyes had shut, and I had seen my beloved grandfather in a dream. He said that, Oh, Hussein, oh, my beloved grandson, Inna Allah sha'a an yaraka qatila. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala desires that you become martyr. Allah desires that you throw your life down for the sake of Islam. Because it has strayed so far. Oh, Hussein, we are waiting for you to make the sacrifice for this deen. 
just like I had made a sacrifice for this deen. And Muhammad ibn Hanafiya heard the words of his brother, the one who had raised him like a father, the one who loved him like a father, would have loved him. And seeing that his brother said that I am going to march to my death for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they say that Muhammad ibn Hanafiya wept a severe weeping, Baka Muhammad Buka and Shadida. And so he knew that Hussein will have to go, he must give his life. But he said, Oh my brother, if you must go to be martyred, if you must go to give your head in the way of Islam, I know that can only happen if Ali Akbar gives his way and gives his life in Islam. And I know that you will only become to be harmed if Abbas is martyred, and that all and Muhammad are martyred, and that Qasim is martyred. But oh my brother, please leave the women and children behind. Please leave our sister Zainab, what they will do to Umm Kulthum, what they will do to Sakina. And Imam Hussein looked at his brother, and he said barely as a whisper, Ya Muhammad, inna Allah shaa an yarahunna sabaya. Oh, my brother, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he wants to see me give my life in the way of Islam to save this deen, he wants that our women and our children, the ladies and daughters of Rasulullah, to be chained in their hands and feet, to have buckles around their necks in order to preserve the message and spread the news of the tragedy. And so Imam Hussein and his caravan left fleeing the Haram of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala towards Iraq, towards Kufa. And they went where the Imam told them to go and they stopped where the Imam had commanded them to stop. And then it came at a point where the horse of Imam Hussein would go no further. And they had tried to move him forward. His horse was a loyal steed. Never had he disobeyed his master. But no matter how much they tried, the horse would go forward no more. He said, oh Abbas, go ask the people, what is this place called? And they came back and said that some people call this place Taf. Some people call this place Shatt al-Furat, the shores of the Euphrates. Some people call this place Ghadiriya. He says, no Abbas, no. There is one name they must have. He said that there are some people here who call this place Karbala. And Imam Hussein, A'udhu Billahi min al karbi wal bala. I seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from tragedy and trials. Oh my family, we will set up camp here. We will stop here. This is our final resting place. And when Zainab heard the words of Imam Hussein, she came forward and said, Oh my brother, ever since we have come here, I have felt a strange shaking in my heart that I cannot overcome. Why do we not move forward? Can we not leave this place? And Imam Hussein would have turned to his beloved sister and said, Oh my sister, oh Zainab, we are not the first to be here. On the way back from the battle of Safin, Amir al-Mu'mineen came back through Iraq and he saw red sands. And he said out loud, Sabran ya Aba Abdullah, oh patience. Imam Hussein, patience, my beloved son. Isbir, isbir. That Amir al had come to the land of Karbala and he came to a particular spot on the ground and he called his family over and he said that, Oh, my beloved family, this is where the camps will become surrounded. This is where my beloved sons will throw down their lives. This is where... Ali Akbar will be slain. This is where Qasim will be cut into pieces. This is where my son Abbas will fight without anything but a water vessel in his mouth. This is where the tents will be caught on fire. This is where the women of Bani Hashem will be chained in looking at the heads of their beloved. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Wa sayya'alamu alladheena zhalamu. أي منقلب ينقلبون ما تموحسين <تصفيق>